non me. I'd like to call this meeting to order. The Ridgewood Village Council Public Workshop. Today is February 26, 2020. The time is 7.30 p.m. Adequate notice of this meeting has been provided by posting on the bulletin board in Village Hall, by mail to the Ridgewood News, the record, and by submission to all persons entitled to same as provided by law of a schedule including the date and time of this meeting. Roll call, please. Deputy Mayor Knudsen. Here. Councilman Seaton. Here. Councilman Boyd is absent. Councilwoman Walsh. Here. Mayor Hache. Here. Please stand for flag salute. Please join us in a moment of silence in honor of the brave men and women serving our nation's armed forces and its first responders. Thank you. We'll start with public comments, not to exceed three minutes per person. Good evening. Can you just make sure the microphone is on? Is the, is the light on there? Usually the first speaker of the night gets this. Yes. <laughs> uh, Richard Brooks, 777 East Ridgewood Avenue. Um, good evening. Thank you all for your service to the community. Um, I'm here to express support for bonding on behalf of Maple Park East Lighting Project. This project is an evolutionary next step for Maple Park one of the most heavily used recreation facilities in the village. Two years ago, we replaced the turf surface. The lighting system will increase opportunities for village residents to use the facility. Maple Park, like many other recreational fields in town, currently utilizes diesel-powered construction lights after dark. These antiquated machines are environmentally dirty, energy inefficient, and rely on a lighting technology developed decades ago. They were not designed for athletic field lighting. The proposed Musco lighting system, on the other hand, is designed for field illumination and is state-of-the-art in terms of design, energy usage, and lighting efficiency. There is no noise, no exhaust, and because the light is targeted, no light spill. The investment in this village facility is unique. There is a cost-sharing commitment between the village, the county, and a consortium of village sports organizations that will utilize the field. Baseball and softball, soccer, junior football, and lacrosse organizations have contributed funds to the lighting project. Importantly, this is a continued investment by the sports organizations in the facilities they play on and in. The demand for recreation space in the village is increasing as more and more adults choose to play recreational team sports like soccer, flag football, baseball, and softball. In addition, the recent closure of the Orchard School Field will lead to a juggling of the spring schedule as we accommodate kids who would have played soccer or lacrosse there. I urge you to support this investment in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Sergeant Lehman, 234 Union Street. I would like to speak to the council about an incident that occurred at your council meeting on February 19th, 2020. At that meeting, a resident came forward and spoke about an article which appeared in the record on the following day, February 20th. The article makes reference to an incident in Elmwood Park that took place between a borough council member and an employee of the borough of Elmwood Park. The resident in question then made reference to what he deemed to be a similar situation in this village and made a request of this council to launch an investigation into that situation. I strenuously object to the comments made by the resident who appears to have appointed himself as a member of some sort of local moral police. Everyone in that room on that day knew what he was referring to. I certainly did watching at home. I find this behavior to be beyond deplorable and certainly inappropriate for a council meeting. Beyond that, I find the council's behavior equally deplorable for entertaining those comments. 
I have been to plenty of council meetings where personal attacks on council members and village, village residents were shut down by the mayor, the deputy mayor, the president pro tem, and anyone on the council who feels so moved. I would even venture to say that the village attorney could have objected to what was being said because it was just so reprehensible, even scurrilous. All of you on the dais should be ashamed of yourselves for your failure to act. As long as we are asking for investigations of unnamed parties, how about I ask that the resident who spoke might be investigated? On what basis is he asking for an investigation? Is he stalking the unnamed parties and using his knowledge from that activity? Are others enabling him and feeding him information? Is there a conspiracy to do harm to unnamed persons? Is it legitimate for the resident to be afforded access to police scenes where he takes pictures that he then sells to various news organizations, access that the ordinary resident would not have in the normal course of events? You, the council, are in a position to put an end to this kind of presentation at council meetings. Please do so for the sake of civility and fair and just government. I love that you're laughing about it. It's great. Uh, totally I'm irresponsible. Thank you. And unprofessional. Thank you. Anybody else? Public comments? All right, we'll uh, close public comments. I have a comment. Okay. I'd just like to comment that the hypocrisy in the uh, last commenter should not be lost on anyone mm -hmm. at all. Thank you. Yeah. Manager's reports. Okay, um, the Hudson Street garage, as we know, the crane is there at Hudson Street. They're moving the precast panels into place. The corner um, stone area of the garage is now standing. Uh, again, as a reminder, there will be closures of Hudson Street during the day, and South Broad Street will be closed intermittently, but both streets will be open for vehicles in the evening. Village Council candidate packets are available in the Village Clerk's Office. The completed forms are due back to the Village Clerk's Office by March 9th at 4 p.m. There are three Village Council seats up for election. There's an opportunity to be a poll worker on election day here in Ridgewood. It's $200 for the day, which is 5.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. You must be at least 18 years old. You must be a Bergen County resident, registered to vote, and you must attend a two-hour training class. If interested, please call the Bergen County Board of Elections. Parking kiosks are being installed throughout the CBD. Um, hopefully the project should be completed in the next couple of weeks. At the kiosk, you enter a license plate number and pay using coins or credit cards. There's a 3% convenience fee if you use a credit card. You do not have to display the receipt on your windshield. The 15-minute parking spaces at the ends of each um, uh, side street will remain in effect um, with meters. Our police department has started using Carfax, which will allow accident reports to be available online 24-7. This also allows people who are involved in accidents and are not in the area during records department hours to get their reports. Carfax charges their customer for the service and donates $5 per accident report to the Ridgewood Police Department. In preparation for the summer and the need for certified lifeguards at Graydon Pool, the American Red Cross is advertising their waterfront lifeguard training for a sand bottom facility, which will be held in May or June. Age Friendly Ridgewood, there are several presentations being scheduled at the library. Elder law presentation, including estate planning and elder law issues, Tuesday, March 3rd, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Learn how to organize legal and financial affairs. Medicare 101 will be presented by Sheila Brogan on April 22nd at 6.30 p.m. And Mary Cregan will speak about her book, The Scar, A Personal History of Depression and Recovery, May 6th at 7 p.m. The Weight Loss Challenge Cook kickoff will um, take place. This is sponsored by the Mayor's Wellness Campaign, the Ridgewood Health Department, Fitness Academy, Health Barn USA, and the Valley Hospital. The ch challenge kickoff event will be held on Monday, March 9th at Village Hall. To register for the challenge, please call 1-877-283-2276. The U.S. Census Bureau is currently hiring for the 2020 Census. The positions are temporary with varying pay ranges. 
For census takers in Bergen County, the pay starts at $19 per hour. If you are interested in a job, please visit the Census Bureau job site to apply. Uh, recreation programs, time to tone it up, fitness class, Wednesday evenings starting March 18th from 4.45 to 5.45 p.m. in the youth lounge of the community center. This is part of the Ridgewood Weight Loss Challenge. Introduction to beekeeping, half-day seminar taught by Frank Mortimer, who's an adjunct instructor at Cornell University Master Beekeeping Program. The seminar is designed for people that have never kept bees before. Students will gain a basic understanding of what is needed to safely, productively, and enjoyably begin keeping bees. That's being held on Sunday, March 8th, 11.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Um, upcoming events, Sunday, April 19th is Earth Day um, and Daffodil Festival at Memorial Park at Van Ness Square, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. This year's Earth Day Fair theme is 2020, Act Now for our Green Ridgewood. Highlights the importance of sustainability and showcases how Green Ridgewood assists the village in going green. Plans for the festival include many interactive eco-themed activities, learning about environmental progress, discovering what green challenges are on the horizon, and finding out how you can contribute to a more sustainable community. And then Saturday, April 25th, there's a mobile shredding event, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m., rain or shine at Graydon Pool parking lot, free to Ridgewood residents and businesses, and you can watch as your documents are destroyed. Um, Village Council upcoming meetings. Uh, this Monday, March 2nd, it's the final budget uh, meeting with the Village Council here in this room at 5 p.m. March 4th is a public work session at 7.30 p.m. There will be a presentation by MV5 on the master plan uh, visioning and then the Ridgewood Library Project. Um, they'll come and present an updated plan that evening. On March 11th is the Village Council public meeting. Uh, the introduction of the 2020 budget will take place at that meeting. And then March 25th is the Village Council public work session. All right, thank you. Go to Council Reports, Councilman Seaton. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Nothing to report this week. All right, Deputy Mayor. Sure, thank you. Uh, Planning Board will be meeting um, Tuesday evening right here in the courtroom. Uh, New Jersey Futures and NV5 and the uh, Master Plan Committee will be doing both doing presentations. New Jersey Future will go first and then uh, NV5 and the uh, Visioning Committee, Master Plan Committee. So we're excited. We invite everyone. The Planning Board will really have an opportunity to ask questions, weigh in. Oh. Someone got in the hallway. Hmm. I thought I heard it. Oh. oh. We'll just wait for the village attorney to come back and weigh in on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, so again, planning board, 730 right here. Come on over and uh, you'll hear the planning board will have an opportunity to ask questions, comment, and, uh, and then as the village manager pointed out, uh, the Master Plan Committee and NV5 will be here on Wednesday doing the same presentation in a public forum. And I know our, our Planning Board Chairman Richard Joel is here this evening. He'll be heading that up, I believe, uh, next Wednesday night as well. So that's it. Thank you. Right, thank you. Councilman Walsh? Um, I'm just going to add to the library report. Um, there's only about 50 tickets left for the author's luncheon. So if anybody is planning on going, they should get their tickets quickly because they sold out even quicker last year, but uh, I think there's about 50 tickets left. And then, yes, the library is going to come back next week with the um, updated plans to the library. Uh, the application is very cumbersome, and they've been really working hard on trying to get the application done in the deadline, but there's a lot of moving parts, so they're really um, kind of behind the eight ball getting it done. But, uh, but everything's moving along. That's all I had. Thank you. Um, not uh, a lot of things to report. I just want to add, um, I know there was a comment made earlier uh, in public comments about the Maple uh, Field Lighting Project. We will bring that back for, uh, bring it in for a vote by the council at the next uh, work session, uh, uh, public meeting, so, uh, March 11th. You know, I actually have a question on that. Sure. So um, when Rich was speaking, I'm sorry, it just made me think about the number of um, teams that are playing, uh, kids and mm -hmm. adults. 
And I just wondered, can we, do we have a whole list, like an inventory of the teams that are playing? We Everybody, do. You do. It's, it's in the fields committee schedule. So can we get a copy of that just for the village council sure. to take a look at? Because I, it's an interesting point that you raised that more and more adults are engaging in um, organized sports. So yeah. I just would be interested in seeing that. I'm sorry, it's hard. <laughs> All right. Thank but you. We'll, we'll bring it back uh, on the 11th. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, just want to just provide an update cause, because last week we had talked about the, um, the Glenwood Road issue, and I know that the council, not all the members were able to make that meeting, so we had a discussion in closed session and just wanted to give everybody an update on what, what's happening um, with the situation. Uh, I, we just sent out a letter. I wrote a letter uh, to NJDOT, and, you know, the position is that there has to be a more collaborative uh, approach to, to the discussion regarding Glenwood Road. Um, you know, we're not here to denigrate the, uh, the engineering aspects of the plan. I think that from a safety standpoint, uh, I think the plan is actually great. It's a much needed improvement to the intersection. But where I think it's lacking is in the, the involvement of the affected, uh, impacted communities. Uh, and not just residential communities, but also Bergen County was not even consulted on this project. Uh, the 2,400 cars that, that travel on that road every day that can't go back up the hill are now going to spill out onto five county roads and the county was never consulted. So we need to bring the county into the table. We need to bring Hohokas in the table. Ridgewood has never been involved in any of the discussions. Uh, they, we were never invited to be part of those discussions. So we're just asking that we have a, a, a more robust discussion. Uh, and the other issue that we had is that when you look at all the different uh, safety measures and the things that you can do to the intersection, although they were sort of boasting that this would be the most expensive uh, train railroad intersection project in New Jersey, they ignored the, the safest option, which would be to widen the road, and that was never uh, considered. We don't know why. We do have some plans back from late 1970s of, uh, of doing an improvement of, the, of what it would entail to do the winding on the road. Again, it, it needs to be part of the discussion. Um, and since then, I know that Councilwoman Walsh has, uh, and, and I did as well, contact their Assemblyman uh, Christopher De Phillips uh, to ask for his help in, uh, in, in leading some of the discussion. And he is scheduling a, uh, a meeting, I believe, for next week to try to bring in the uh, NJDOT and, and just get everybody to talk to each other. Uh, it just seems that there was this plan that had kind of been put forward, but uh, not much input from those who would be most greatly impacted. Um, that's all I have. Okay. So we're going through discussion items. I do want to mention we are discussing the permanent lighting in Maple Park Field later uh, in this meeting as well. Um, but uh, we'll start with Ridgewood Water. And um, the gate at the Warden Dyke facility, which is in Midland Park, is in disrepair and requires replacement. Uh, the Water Department went out for three quotes. They're recommending the approval of the gate replacement by AAA Inc. and Zaloni Fence um, at $20,012, uh, $20, and that's found in the water capital budget. I did skip, I, I apologize, I did skip the presentation by New Jersey Future. Um, so this is the group that actually um, did what we wanted to do here in Ridgewood. So there were several people involved with this, so we'll have that group come up. I know it's um, um, comprised of Richard Joel, who's the, sec um, the chair of the planning board, um, Marianne Bucci-Carter, who is our planner, and who is coming from Age Friendly, both Sheila Brogan and um, Beth Abbott. So if you could come up front, please, we would appreciate it. Yeah, you can sit and just make sure you turn on the light on the um, microphones. Thank you. So uh, if you recall, we did have a presentation from Tanya Rohrbeck, who is from New Jersey Future, and she basically gave an overview of what New Jersey Future is. And so this is what um, we as a group um, decided was important for Ridgewood. And so that's what this group will discuss. Good evening. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, um, some of your time tonight. I know time is precious. So um, we're here just as a follow-up. I know uh, two weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, um, Tanya from uh, New Jersey Future made a presentation to you. So this is what's happening uh, from uh, or with New Jersey Future, the Village of Ridgewood, and H-Friendly um, Ridgewood. 
So tonight, you know the, all, everybody who's here, so I won't bother with that. Um, let's see. So the project, um, as you know, for uh, New Jersey Futures has been funded through the Taub Foundation. They're the same foundation that has funded uh, the Age-Friendly Communities Initiative. And, um, and we're so pleased, really, that the village has embraced this initiative and agreed to work with New Jersey Futures on looking at some of the recommendations. So in September, Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry. In September and again in December, a group of people from the village, and you can see, I won't name them all, the list, it's, it's pretty extensive and very representative of, of um, the village, were involved in looking at the report that came from New Jersey Future. Remember, if it was a 63-page report with a number of recommendations. We prioritized the recommendations and formalize some action ideas, um, all in an effort to look at uh, improving Ridgewood's age friendliness. I'm going to turn it over to Beth. So uh, we thought about land use in Ridgewood and the challenges it presents for older residents. And two main thing, themes kept coming up. Oh, we'd have to go to the next. Didn't it move? Oh, there it is. Here we go. I think so two main th themes kept coming up, the pedestrian safety and housing choices. Um, how did we conclude this? Um, as you know, Age Friendly Ridgewood has done two large community surveys the last few years. There's been a lot of focus groups with groups like Hilt, uh, Ridgecrest, groups of neighborhood restaurant, uh, res um, residents. Um, NV5 ran a focus group at our steering committee. And also we have recommendations from the two professional studies, which was the walkability workshop in 2017 and the land use report in 2018. I don't know where this reacts again. Okay. So with the professional guidance of New Jersey Future, the, the whole project committee identified these broad goals for the project. So they involve pedestrian safety, housing diversity, a mixed use downtown, engaging residents, and supporting the community design goals. I know, where is the place? <laughs> I thought it was that there. Oh no, Wrong I turned button. it off. Wrong Great. button. <laughs> <laughs> computer's not aged. Okay, here we go. Uh, so digging deeper into those goals, yeah. <laughs> Wait, can, I, can I just, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but do we have a copy of this? Is there, did we all receive copies? Uh, we received a working paper that was uh, written. Part of the reason is I see. Oh, mine's working. Never mind, I have a big copy right in front of oh, me. Okay, now. good. <laughs> Too bad nobody else does. Do you know how to turn it on? Yeah, no, there's a button. Bernadette, can you get the button? No, no, the button's not there. I think it's not a button. Yeah. 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 So you can, watch, you can watch what's up there on your screens uh, in front of you, huh? huh? Oh, and it just needs electric. There's a plug right here. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, you just couldn't see it. Sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, no, I understand. So um, the group dug deeper into those broad goals and identified these specific actions that we could pursue. Um, things like looking at problematic intersections, complete street strategies, uh, pop, uh, pop up tra traffic calming, um, strategies to diversify housing options, looking at street furniture and bus stops, 
and establishing a phased uh, sidewalk and crosswalk improvement plan. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Rich and Marianne, and they're going to go into those things a little further. Okay. Uh. <laughs> the only slide I'm going to have. So. Uh, aging Friendly is seeking to promote certain priorities involving community design, housing, affordability, walkability, transportation, and community engagement as they affect older individuals. The Ridgewood Planning Board has a visioning project going on right now, which will be used to create a new master plan. And the new master plan will set forth the future priorities for land use in the village. And the Aging Friendly initiative kind of complements this. They had some input. It'll be taken into consideration for it in developing uh, the new master plan for the uh, village. There'll be certain items that'll cross over into uh, the work that was done by NB5 and uh, the master plan that will eventually be prepared based upon the visioning project that we have. I mean, there's an aging population that we have and uh, seniors as a group have different needs, so we have to be aware of those needs. And Aging Friendly has created awareness of this and have, has provided input. Tanya Rohrbach made a presentation to the council a couple of weeks ago, and she'll also be making a presentation to uh, the planning board on uh, March 3rd, next Tuesday, as Deputy Mayor Knudsen mentioned. So the visiting project will be coming to uh, the four at that meeting, so it'll be interesting to see everything that's going to be reviewed there. So there'll be a presentation, and then you will actually see what was done by NB5 and what input was taken in, and then you can see how it would address uh, the older uh, population of the town and how it will improve the town as a whole. So uh, there's a lot of good things to be looking forward to through the planning board and also with the assistance of uh, input from the community and from Aging Friendly. In the in the um, the draft visioning document, um, and generally most uh, master plan documents are um, from uh, a grander view. They're from high up. They're looking down and they're trying to um, basically give an, an overview. And one of their one of the goals is to enhance the comfort, safety, and mobility of re for residents and of the downtown. And so. One of the, the outcomes of the work that was done with the New Jersey Future Committees was exactly that. And the goal for this New Jersey Future uh, team is to try and take that to the next step and take some, identify some actionable um, improvements that can actually take those grand master plan goals and, and implement them. Um, at least start to and identify who is responsible for what and kind of get things moving so that um, these types of improvements always take place and are a continual part of the community. And um, so, so one of the first things to go along with um, the first priority that came out was evaluate problematic intersections, um, identify some street strategies. Um, so the, the, the discussion that came out of this was ways to do that that may be inexpensive and just try and approach this in a way that realistically can get it done in a way that's easy and simple. Um, one of, one of the, uh, the possible tools that came out of that is to do demonstration projects. Um, we're going to go to the next slide. Because from even on this slide, you can see there's lots of different ways to do that. There's always a lot of debate. No one knows whether we should, you do bump outs or you do change the curbing, you add more landscaping, you change the parking, you change the bike lanes. There's a lot of discussion. And a lot of times nothing happens because there's so much, so many options out there. So the, one of the ways that has been um, 
successful across the country has been to do demonstration projects like the one pictured where um, you could just do a temporary improvement that is in place for maybe a week or maybe a weekend or the community gets to design it, they get to try it out, they see if they like it, they see if it works, see if it works for the cars, for the pedestrians and it's, um, and it's ways to improve the, the downtown, the streetscape, the experience for the pedestrian and, and the car driver um, in a way that is just measurable. Um, if you do something, you, tie, you, you draw it out and it works, maybe you make that permanent. Um, if it doesn't work, you try out something else. And it's something that the community can be involved in, they can take part in, their ideas can be implemented. So it's one option that came up that we wanted to bring up to, to the council and see if that's something in that direction that you, you know, would be interested in going. The next slide. Um, identifies some examples of this happening across the country. It's not cooperating. Batteries. Maybe we could just do it with the keyboard. Can we get down and get it a little bit? Can you just hit it with the keyboard? Yeah, that's oh, a good idea. Maybe. Maybe it needs new batteries, right? That is possible. That's yeah, it. Yeah. yeah. So they come in all shapes and sizes. Um, some of them are done for pop-up parks, but some of them are done for intersection improvements. Um, they could be done for closing portions of streets, or um, there's all types of applications depending on what's needed. Changing a bus stop, um, adding seating in, in a node, or, or bumping out a curb. And all these things um, are, are components of what's happening in, in modern downtowns, which makes places more desirable, more livable, um, helps out businesses, just makes the community more vital. Um, one of the things that, um, that is an option, if, if this is something that seems like you might want to do, I do teach a, um, a design class at Rutgers in the fall. Um, so have students that always need projects. They're like the type of people would love could bring them in and let them build something or paint something and come up with and evaluate it. And you know, so that's that's an option for the fall if this is something you're interested in. Um, but those those are you know something to think about uh, to take the grander view and make things happen. And and then there's also other types of things that can be done fairly easily as well, which came out of the surveys. Yeah. Oh, back to, yeah. <laughs> so another um, idea that came out, oh, we sorry, go yeah, so go, go back one. Yeah. Another idea that came um, out was uh, to survey the street furniture and bus stops. So we have a lot of bus stops in the town. Um, some are busy and have no cover or seating about it. Now, whether in fact a bus stop like uh, the, a sheltered bus stop would fit, that is something to be evaluated, but there may be some spots where that might be helpful. And the second is um, to increase, and uh, we'll evaluate what we have in street furniture right now and then, you know, does it need to be replaced um, or is there a need for more? And you'll see Age Friendly um, donated three benches to the village last year and one is by Stop and Shop in, on Franklin and if you are going by there, there is someone sitting on that bench on, on a regular oh, nice. basis. So here we have Claudia uh, and uh, Eugene um, enjoying a little um, afternoon rest. But it's a, it's a, that's a good spot and that's what we want to evaluate. Where are the good spots where people are walking, may, maybe carrying bags and might need respite for a little while before they walk on? This happens to be a very popular spot um, at the time. Uh, the other idea that came um, out of our meetings with New Jersey Future, next slide. And, and Beth already mentioned it, was to have, a, and you already are doing this to some extent, planned um, expenditures on improving sidewalks. 
so we have a couple of pictures. I know you've been working hard in the downtown area and of course along Glen Avenue and we certainly are uh, grateful for that. Um, and, but uh, you know, the idea is, as you know, is to m put that into your capital budget each year and to phase in um, the sidewalk improvements that are happening. And I think to show what you are doing, um, to have some kind of a tracking uh, mechanism on your website that says, you know, these are the, al already the improvements we've made, these are the improvements for the following year or, or whatever. So people can really see uh, how much work you are actually doing and of course the work gets done. So uh, we're grateful for that. So basically the result of this effort is, are going to be um, implementation plans uh, thoughtfully prepared by this skilled and professional group. Um, we also have access to speakers to, to uh, illuminate some of the concepts. And in closing, I just want to say I think the advantage of all the work that's been happening the last few years by you and so many in the village uh, you know, the senior bus, the improved sidewalks, the um, elder dinner, is that older residents are feeling more included and considered, and we're hearing that from them. So this, this is an effort just to keep that, that going. So um, we're, uh, we welcome your feedback and questions. I'm just going to say thank you, but I have to point out that in as much as this is age friendly, it's really just human friendly. It's kind of just for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we seem to be distinguishing it as age friendly, but you know, anybody, mm -hmm. children, you know, young adults, adults. Yeah, I different. think as we um, started this process, and I think as we've remarked before, as we improve the community for our older citizens, we improve the community for everyone. Yeah. You Im improve the walkability, you improve the safety, all that makes a difference for the whole community. Yeah. And, and, and the walkability piece of it is something, even in our visioning process, that came up um, from just about every age group. Everybody said exactly the same thing. For those of us that walk downtown all the time, that are walking, we see those little you know, breaks in the sidewalk and we know how important it is that, that those are addressed. So I thank you and I think it's beneficial. It's also beneficial from, just from a general operating sense for the village because as we're kind of monitoring what the improvements are for the sidewalks that we're using, mm -hmm. that also helps us Yeah, I just wanted to thank everyone for their efforts. Anything to make the downtown more inviting and, and safer is always, it's always welcome. So I mean, Franklin Avenue is going to, there's plans for, for that to be upgraded and taken care of with all the construction going on downtown, but that's not all of, all of downtown. So this is, this is something we have to, you know, we have to repair the curb work. We have to do, uh, we, we already did some work with the tree wells. We took away the trip hazards and the water barriers and there's still some more work. There's a lot more work to be done with the tree wells and that will provide a nice canopy and shade to complement some of the benches that are around town. So it's a collaborative effort and it's, it's really mm -hmm. good. So I appreciate all the help and leaning in with this. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll just add, um, you know, the benches are interesting because um, a lot of elderly people that I know can walk a distance and then they definitely need some place to stop. And if they're not going into an establishment, they really, you know, there's no place for them to sit unless they have a bench. So they kind of plan their route based on if they're getting dropped off, where they're going to be or where they're going to end up so that they can get picked up either at a bench or someplace where they can be seated. So I think that's, you know, probably one of the more important things in the village. So thanks. I, you know, I don't know all the improvements that will happen on Franklin Avenue, but um, Franklin might be a, a good spot if you were thinking about doing a demonstration project with bump outs and that before you actually did the build, um, you know, yeah. um, or I know another area that um, comes up in conversation is um, that whole uh, Broad Street, um, Ridgewood Avenue, what do I do? <laughs> you know, stop signs on that side, it's not a four-way stop. 
Oak Street. I know there was improvements to Oak Street, but maybe there are others. So yeah. there might be opportunities um, to, to bring students in and, and do some design work. And it's paint. And it can be paved over if it doesn't work. So it, it's just a thought um, as you move forward. Yeah. So, you know, it's a, it's a great thought, but I just wonder, and I think it's something from we'd have to coordinate because Franklin is a county road. And so mm -hmm. presumably we have to go through the county, even if we want to make just temporary test bump outs and, and painting, we can't, we just don't have the option to go and do that. So I, I think we'd have to figure out how we initiate that. But I, I love the idea of your students, um, you know, taking Ridgewood as a little test project. Mm -hmm. Is it a year of the Yeah. would be great. Okay, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. So now we'll go back to the discussion. Again, I apologize for skipping over that uh, originally. Um, so A2 is the water utility interest rates for delinquent accounts, and um, three is water administrative maintenance fees. So these are both annual resolutions which set the interest rates for delinquent accounts or um, for delinquent, um, de delinquent accounts similar to non-payment of taxes. It also sets a 30-day grace period. And then the one that sets the administrative fees, this is for Ridgewood Water Utility to pay the Village of Ridgewood based on the total property tax indicated by the assessed value of the land, excluding the improvement. And this is paid quarterly on the same due dates as property taxes. Heather, I just actually had a question on something else when we were at the, did you, we already did the fencing, right? Uh, no, we did, the, yes, we did. So did, I, did you I have a question? A qu I, I did, I had a question, okay. but you know, because you did that and then we went to Age Friendly sure, and then go we're going to go back to that and sure. I had a question, but we jumped over right over to Age uh, Friendly. Sorry, so go ahead. So um, on the fence, I, on, uh, let me just see. Triple A, we have Triple A, right? The yes, elevator. correct. But on, is it CNS? Mm -hmm. So I, I actually thought the word was a technical term, dorking, but then I realized that it's dorking. Mm -hmm. On CNS fencing, it states that they are reusing the existing dorking 1808 system due to the requested dorking 1812 system not being compatible with the existing wiring. But then on the other one, they have um, the Door King 1808 entry system replacing that, mm -hmm. and it looks like they've integrated that 1812 into that price already. Correct. But, but the other guy is already saying the 1812 is incompatible, so I'm just wondering. I, I can ask for further information. Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? Because they mm -hmm. baked that 1812 into that bid, but on CNS they're already saying that that doesn't work. Correct. Okay, so I see what you're saying. I'll, I'll get more information. Out. Thank you. Were there any other questions on that? That was it for me. Okay. Um, so those other two resolutions that I explained, were there any questions on those? Again, they were annual resolutions. Okay, um, so parking, uh, West Ridgewood Avenue, 15 minute parking spaces. So this ordinance does a few things. Um, it codifies all four 15-minute parking spaces along eastbound West Ridgewood Avenue between Wilsey Square and Washington Place into the same section of the code. Uh, if you recall, previously they were in Chapter 265-29 and then Chapter 265-69. Um, uh, the next location clarifies the language describing a 15-minute parking space on West Ridgewood Avenue west of Washington Place. We found that out as we were discussing it the last time that we weren't really sure where exactly it was. So it's clarification and then the final um, location, I'm sorry, the next location clarifies the description of a 15 minute parking space along Van Ness Square near the Ridgewood Coffee Company. And then um, this is one that uh, Chris is suggesting, the final one. It proposes to switch one 15 minute parking space on Library Place with one three hour time limit space because in the three hour time limit space is closer to the kiosk, which is actually around the corner. So, um, there'll still be a 15 minute spot, it's just moved in one so that it's not as close to the corner. So I have a question on this because by my, I, I, 
unless I'm missing something by my calculation, are we still missing two spaces? Because if this add what we're adding mm -hmm. is supposed to in, in, have all of those parking spaces on the south side of West Ridgewood Avenue, on the south side of West Ridgewood Avenue between Washington and Wilsey, there are four spaces, but it only refers to two. But then if you continue heading west on the south side of West Ridgewood Avenue, the metered spaces closest to Washington Place are actually west because they're between Washington, between South Monroe and Washington Place. So isn't that supposed to be then between item number, unless, unless it's somewhere else, I don't know, but the where it says West Ridgewood Avenue South, Mm -hmm. It has the two metered spaces closest to Washington Place between Wilsey Square and Washington. I believe there are four there. Right, right. I'll, I'd have to ask Chris. So I'll get more information and bring it back next week. So there's four. So this, so we're still short. I'm still two, yeah, I'm two spaces more. then. I th and unless he has it somewhere else. I'll ask Chris for additional information. Thank you. And bring it back. Um, other than that, were there other questions on this one? Okay. Uh, the next one is amending the time for the general parking in the lots. Um, this is a proposal to allow parking in all the lots from 12 noon on without a permit. Um, there would be a three hour limit. Um, the exceptions would be Cottage Place and the train station. There would obviously the person would have to pay either by Park Mobile or at the kiosk, um, and um, they cannot park in the CBD employee spaces in North Walnut. But this would allow additional parking, especially on the west side where there's such a um, lack of parking. You know, if the commuters aren't there by noon, it's most likely that you know they probably won't be there. So. Um, we are looking to free up those spots if there are any. And there may be some who commute in very early and maybe by one or two may be coming back. And so someone may need a parking place at two or three in the afternoon and they may find it. And uh, they don't have a parking permit because they're not a commuter, but this way they can park there. Right. I mean, this is a follow up. Remember when we, um, we decided to roll back? So 3 p.m. 3 p.m. Any commuter right. spot that wasn't taken, sir, became free game. Right. Mm -hmm. And then obviously to, to subject to observation, and, and that was the observation, that even up to 12 o'clock, there were still a lot of spaces that were being left empty, un unused. Um, so the idea is to just roll it back now to 12. So any, any commuter space that's not taken up by 12 o'clock becomes now kind of free game, but subject to the three hour time limit. Okay, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Logical. It should free up a lot of spots for shoppers and diners. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Okay, um, so the next one is under budget. Heather, I guess the only Sorry. question I have is do they still have to have the resident no. permit? They don't have no, to have they the resident wouldn't. sticker. No, no they would they not. They wouldn't be required to have that. No. Okay. At that point, after 12 noon, they would just have to pay the meter or pay through Park sure. Mobile. Okay. So. Okay. We haven't had any problem with that the other when we first did that. No, we right. have not. So it's, it's been successful, so we're just mm -hmm. expanding on. Yeah, making it earlier, <laughs> right. Um, so budget award contract under state contract. Uh, this is an annual one. This is for diesel fuel and gasoline for all the village vehicles. It's awarded to Allied Oil Company of Hillsborough, New Jersey, um, not to exceed $370,000. And uh, this is in the 2020 operating budget for fleet services. The next one is awarding a contract under state contract for purchase of manholes and catch basin frames and grates. Um, and this is to award it to Campbell Foundry of Harrison, New Jersey, um, an amount not to exceed $38,690.20. And this is in our capital budget funds. The next item is the permanent lighting at um, Maple Park Field. Um, as you recall, we did discuss this. Um, we did um, notify all of the surrounding neighbors. Um, and so the proposal is to um, award the contract to Musco Sports Lighting of Farmingdale, New Jersey. Um, it's under the Sourcewell National Cooperative Pro um, Purchasing. Um, funding for this lighting project, as Mr. Brooks mentioned, is um, $145,000 from the village capital budget, 
$145,000 for the Bergen County Open Space Grant and $140,000 from the Ridgewood Youth Sports Groups. Um, we also um, will need to introduce a bond ordinance for the full amount in order to purchase the sliding improvement and then we do get reimbursed by the grant and the contribution from the sports groups. So <clears throat> why do we have to, uh, why do we have to bond for the whole amount if we're, I can, I we always do. Whenever we get a grant, we have to do the whole amount and then we get reimbursed. We, no, when we get a grant in order to be reimbursed, we have to make the purchase. We get reimbursed when we do that. But why can't we take their, the 140 from new youth, youth sports group and then just bond the 300 because then we can still purchase and then get reimbursed on the half from the grant, hmm. but we're only putting out a three hundred thousand dollar bond. Why? Why would we bond that whole thing and then get that cash back? We don't need to do it that way. <coughs> well, I can ask Bob Rooney and Bond Council if we can do it that way. I'm just wondering. I mean, if I'm we're permitted to, it makes sense. Yeah, because why would we put the? Why would we add that debt to the? If Correct. we don't have to. Okay. So let me see if it's permissible. If so. I mean, I can't imagine why you're so. putting the same 140. I mean, you're still buying sure. it. Sure. No, I understand. They should put the money, the youth sports mm -hmm. group should put the money up front, and mm -hmm. then we have it and we make that purchase. Okay. Okay. So and all we would need then is just the resolution to accept the donation from, this, from the sports groups. We correct? will need that. We'll need to introduce the bond oh, ordinance, okay. and then after the bond ordinance is adopted, then we would award the contract. Got it. Heather, just a quick question. How is it um, How is it broken out? It just says Ridgewood Sports Groups. How is it broken out in terms of what money is coming Individually, I don't know. I can find out. I'm so sure they like have that. Was there we cross yeah, or yeah, RBSA. I mean, if you want that, I can get that yeah, for so you. Yeah, so I think we should have okay. who's paying what. So, so itemized on the Yeah, resolution. yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, it probably makes sense to itemize yeah. it on the resolution, sure. We can okay, that's true. That's a good idea. Right, because the sports group is not a formal organization. Mm -hmm. No, true. Okay. All right, so the next item is um, the interest rate for delinquent taxes and then the interest rate for non-payment of other municipal liens and the interest rate for delinquent significant sewer discharge fees. Again, these are all annual resolutions. These set the interest rates on the non-payment of these various um, liens or payments or bills. Um, it's the same interest rates as delinquent taxes. It sets uh, grace periods for the um, taxes. It's a 10-day grace period. For the um, other liens, it's uh, 25 um, days. Then the council certification of costs and for the sewer discharger fees, it's a 30-day grace period. Um, so those are annual. The next one is extending the sublease agreement for 4345 Hudson Street for Epic Management. As you recall, they're renting, um, Epic is renting 4345 Hudson Street, which is right next to the garage area. Um, this will expire at the end of April. It will have to be renewed, um, an extension of the lease for a few months um, to June. Um, and so this is P and D Partners as a landlord has agreed has agreed to the extension of the lease to the end of June 2020. So we have to do that uh, resolution. So we have that before it expires. No, I did that. Mm -hmm. um, so then we have two bond ordinances um, that we have for the council's consideration to be introduced. One is for the bond ordinance for the improvements to Shedler Field. We discussed it during the um, capital budget or when Chris Ledesauser um, came in and discussed his budgets. So um, the thought was to appropriate $1 million for that this year. And then um, that would be really phase one. He mentioned he'd like to put in the parking lot. Um, obviously there'll be some curbing put in as well. And then also um, he said if um, possible, he'd like to put in some of the walking paths so that we could get um, people to start using the park. Mm -hmm. um, the second one is the bond ordinance providing for various improvements to the Zabriskie Shedler House. 
and that amount is 865,500. This is the final amount for that. Um, we are going to apply for um, historic preservation um, funding through Bergen County. In addition, uh, Connolly and Hickey has recommended that we also apply under the New Jersey Historic Preservation Trust. So um, this is the full amount. We don't obviously know what kind of grant we're going to get, but um, we're hopeful that we can get grants from both of them, and so this will reduce this amount. Um, I think um, it's probably fairly good chance that we'll get the county one. Obviously, the state one is much more competitive. There are more um, you know, entities or uh, municipalities applying, and so um, we may or may not, but it certainly, it may be because it shows that we've moved forward with the um, preservation of this historic house, and this is our final um, part of it. And so Connolly and Hickey thinks we may have a very good chance because of that, because it shows we're moving forward. So I'm then, curious, Heather, so I, I'm obviously Connolly and Hickey knew exactly when, when the historic designation was granted. Did Millennium ever say, hey guys, by the way, you have this project coming up, it's a historic structure, there's a possible grant there, or was that solely from Connolly and Hickey? It was solely from Connolly, okay. Connolly and Hickey. So um, as far as um, the historic aspect of it, um, as far as the Bergen County one, that's one we've always applied for. Right. So they wouldn't have, Millennium would not have gotten involved with that. And then we have still the Friends of Shedler are going to be, uh, right. it appears they're going to be also applying for a grant, a matching mm. grant. Which is great. Right. So and then so, us. yeah, this 865 is going to be reduced by whatever grants come through for us, Friends of Shedler, and then also the New Jersey Historic Preservation Trust. Right. And that's a situation where we have to pay that amount and then get the money back, yeah. unlike the Correct. Right. Good. Correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next one is amend under policy amending the single use plastic bag ordinance. Um, as we discussed, um, we've put together the things that um, both our court enforcement and our health department requested. So it indicates that any reusable bag has to indicate on it that it has a lifetime of 125 uses or the store must have available for inspection a written document from the manufacturer or distributor evidencing that the usable bag made available by it has a lifetime minimum of 125 uses. Um, the enforcement would be through the village health department employees, the employees of the building department, and or any other village official or employee so designated by the village manager. Um, and they can um, do this by investigating complaints or violations, conducting unannounced or random site inspections, or during regularly scheduled inspections of the premises by the registered environmental health specialist. And um, so this, I think, will address um, the concerns of those who enforce it. The um, fines, I believe, just stayed the same from what it was originally, but at least this gives the, them the ability to enforce it also allows the village manager, if need be, to designate someone else to enforce it besides just code enforcement and the health department. Heather, is it 125 uses or 25 uses? 125. 125. So, so the bags that say 25 uses, I've seen a bunch yeah. in stores. That say I, have, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it says 25 uses. Okay, it's 125. Yeah. I don't think they say. 125, and I've actually seen, I think, two. I'll tell you the okay. establishments, but. Okay. Um, Those are not acceptable then. But they're the ones people buy. <coughs> Those are the ones people, they're buying like 10 for 10. So 25 <coughs> uses, it says. Are you talking about the ones like that are the in shop, ones. right? And they're like yeah. the plasticky kind of. So here's a, and <coughs> I think. I think those a, will last more than 25 uses. Though. But I think. To say on the bag, I think the rule was that it had to say 25 uses. No, no it's 125. It definitely. So maybe is 125. it's 125 on the ones with the hand, the you know, like that look like a, a regular shopping bag, like you know the, you know the handled ones and not the plastic ones. Right, but some of the plastic ones are 125 uses. Some mm -hmm. of them. Maybe they're mismarked. So Matt, I, I just have to. I, I, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry. I was going to say maybe they're mismarked. Could be. I just have the question. I know we had this discussion a while back that 
what you can, by ordinance, um, do is that you can say they can't give out the plastic bags to carry the groceries home and they have to use something else. Mm -hmm. But I thought if it was something that was for sale in the store, you didn't have that option to impose an ordinance dictating what can be sold. This is similar to, do you recall that conversation? I remember the conversation. We, yeah, I mean, that was a different issue, though. We're talking about whatever they're going to sell here to um, be able to be viably used for the purposes of transporting goods from a retail store has to be um, appropriate for at least 125 uses. Right. So it it's not, doesn't say that they can't, doesn't keep them from selling anything that they want to sell. It keeps them from selling a, a particular item that's in conformance with this ordinance that has some guidelines or some conditions with it. So it's it's different discussion than what we had talked about before. I'm trying to remember what we had talked about before with regard <coughs> to um, telling them what they could and couldn't sell. I think the issue was, do we have the authority to tell them they couldn't be giving out these plastic bags, these you know single-use plastic bags anymore? And I think that was the discussion, that you had the authority to say you couldn't give those plastic bags out. Right. Well, no but did you them. have the authority, do we have the jurisdiction to say you can't sell something or do we have the jurisdiction or the authority to condition their sales on these parameters i don't and it has to be and, and again i think the discussion was is that we, we we do have the ability to regulate for health and safety and if the health and safety if i i don't know that anybody's tested it yet but if the health and safety have to do with recycling we're able to put some parameters with regard to that and i think <coughs> um, you know maybe somebody's going to try and challenge that at some point or another Right now, nobody's challenged it, but I think we have the right from a health and safety standpoint to put some regulation in there as with regard to what they can and can't sell. I mean, we talk about vaping, we talk about cigarettes, we talk about a number of things. All those are health and safety things, and it's gotten to the point now where single-use plastic bags have risen to that level that it's a serious consideration for health and safety reasons. Okay. So I think, I think we're safe. I mean, I don't think there's any problem with regard to that. Okay. Right, and actually in our original ordinance that we adopted, it does say it needs 125 uses. So that's nothing new in this new one. It's just incorporated in a better way. Okay, any other questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we already, uh, the mayor gave the update on Glenwood Road, mm -hmm. so that's good. And uh, so that's all I have for tonight. All right. We'll go back to public comments, not to exceed five minutes per person. Uh, good evening, Boyd Loving, 342 mm -hmm. South Irving Street. Uh, I had sent a note to some members of the council regarding the park and ride. Uh, I have learned that the Airbrook limousine service, their lease was terminated or they decided to vacate the space and the Avis rental car agency that was located at that location is also gone. So uh, Ann and I drove through there the other day and there is a tremendous amount of space now available at that location. I don't know, um, it it's, doesn't seem as though this has not been discussed here, not heard any public discussion as to whether DOT has informed you that, uh, that the space is now vacant, what their plans are for it, um, it appears as though that there were many spaces still in the village managed portion of the lot when we drove through. So I'm just wondering, is the park and ride going to be increased in size? Will the village or NJDOT be trying to negotiate with Coach to begin more bus service from that location? Or is there some sort of private concern that is going to occupy the space? I know a few years ago DOT put up a larger salt shed um, without notifying the village. I guess they notified the village that they were putting it up, but that was basically about it. We're putting it up, and there was no discussion about the size or the, the appearance or anything. So I'm just wondering um, if the village should be contacting DOT to find out what's going on, what their plans are for the space before we wind up with an amusement park there that we don't know anything about. You kind of know what I'm saying. If you don't ask, you never know what's going to happen. And uh, there may be an opportunity for some revenue generation if they let the village manage the area. Um, and they may have informed you, but maybe there's been no public discussion about it yet. Thank you very much. Any 
quiet crowd tonight. We closed public comments. Um, Heather, was there any any uh, any information that we received? We have from not yet heard back from DOT. Uh, this just re happened recently, and it just happened recently that we board, we the village have boarded up that um, previous trailer that Airbrook was using. Um, so we're in the process now of um, starting good discussions with them as to how other parts of that land will be used. I agree there are a lot of spaces available and it may be possible that even we could you know take over some of that space so I, I can even add to that because it, I know Chris has been involved with DOT on a number of um, instances particularly most recently we've gotten uh, we're able to get Avis uh, to uh, leave possession of that area and that's only recent I would say within the last month so um, they were just holed over hoping nobody would notice but uh, so Avis is out of there now, and I think that's freeing everything up, and I think probably now is a great time to, uh, to deal with that issue. Thank you. All right, we'll take a resolution to go into closed session. Be resolved by the Village Council of the Village of Bridgewood that the Village Council meet in closed session on February 26, 2020. At 7.30 p.m. or as soon thereafter as the matter on the agenda can be reached mm -hmm. and that said closed session be held in the caucus room of the Ridgewood Village Hall, 131 North Maple Avenue, Ridgewood, New Jersey. Be it further resolved that the matters to be discussed in closed session are limited to personnel matters to include Ridgewood Police Department. These matters are allowable under NJSA 10-4-12 at SEC. And be it further resolved that the minutes of this meeting shall be made available to the general public when such matters have been deemed completed by resolution of the Village Council. I have so motion. Uh, second. So, okay. Yeah. So moved me. I, I moved it. I moved it. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Don't leave me. Don't let me make the decision. <laughs> I don't know what it's about. Yeah. Happy Ash Wednesday. Happy Ash Wednesday. Happy Ash Wednesday. Happy Ash Wednesday. Happy Ash Wednesday.